Dubai. Um, we're super happy to have you here in the um, yeah, essentially, uh, we wanted to, uh, on one hand, uh, being Mindir is super tech focused, kind of share a bit of, of what we're doing, right? Sharing and, and learning is key for us to for us all, I guess, in the in the tech community, to continue evolving and doing things better. Um, also, um, we just wanted, as part of that community, to give back a bit and therefore. Uh, hopefully teach some of the things that we're doing here, some of the things that we believe uh, are or could be state of the art, some better, some some things that we're still improving. Obviously, it's it's part of our life. So, so yeah, um, just um, so from considering today, we'll have um, six talks in each room, ranging from different uh, topics. So some majority more tech specific, then we'll also co cover uh, agile and uh, culture. And just a few reminders, um, actually, so if you're wearing the t-shirt, we'll take that as an okay for us then to share photos and videos uh, on social media or whatever. So if you don't want to be part of those photos and don't want to have your image shared, uh, don't, please don't wear the t-shirt, okay? Um, then um, we'll also have um, just office tours um, starting at the coffee break uh, each 10 minutes. So if you want to take a look around and see uh, what, what other offices uh, we have at uh, Mindira, please join one of, one of those. Um, we also have, you might, as you might have seen at the registration, workshops starting um, on each parts of the day, so before the coffee break and after the coffee break. Um, so if you have uh, if you have registered for one of those, it's on the typewriter room, which is uh, 404. You go along the balcony and um, and you'll have the room there. Um, and um, I think that's pretty much it. So, Jose, the, well, I don't think you need this here. No, one. okay. Uh, so please. Cool, start. thanks for, Thank the, for, for the, doing the introductions. Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Jose. Uh, I'm uh, one of the founders of Mindera, um, and uh, today I'm going to make a small presentation of uh, a component that we built about a couple of years ago that we use uh, pretty much on uh, all of our uh, all, all of our stack. And um, I wanted to share a little bit. It's not uh, yet open source, but it will uh, it will soon be. It's called the Traffic Splitter, and uh, I'll just I guess get on with it. And uh, all right, so what's the problem that we had? When we, um, when we decided to build this component. We had uh, a client that came to us. Uh, we were building a website for them. Uh, this website, it was specific to uh, horse racing betting. And uh, the website had uh, a mobile version and a desktop version. It's actually not a responsive website. I don't know if you're familiar with these things, so feel free to always interrupt me if, if I say something that you don't understand. But in this specific case, it's actually two different websites the desktop couldn't quite be collapsed to a mobile version that would make sense and the other way around would also not work. Now, they uh, are a very complex um, brand with multiple websites, multiple brands and uh, multiple domains. And what happened was that we had, uh, um, I think maybe in total about 16 domains and, uh, and what I mean by domains is that you have your main www dot, you've got your mobile dot, and then you've got your mobile dot brand A dot, and you've got your mobile dot brand B, and some of the websites had mobile versions, some didn't, and that's, that was just the existent um, stack. So we had to build a new site, but being such a, a complex and highly transactional website, we couldn't quite just build a site and then launch it and get everyone on it. So everyone wanted to uh, ensure that we could do a smooth rollout and uh, you know, maybe serve the site, ser start with the mobile site, serve it to about 10-20% uh, of the users, get some metrics in, understand how it's performing, both uh, in terms of technology and in terms of, uh, of I guess, financial return. And, um, and that was very, was very complex to do because the usual strategy and the strategy that that particular company had done in the past would be to create a new subdomain, but there's already 16 subdomains, so they would just go with, well, let's just launch this new beta dot blah, blah, blah. Right, so uh, it became quite complex to, to try to solve that problem. And uh, the other aspect of this is that all of these domains had really complex redirection rules between them. So uh, if you were on a specific state in the United so this is for a, a United States client, if you were on a specific state, say you were on New Jersey and you tried to access the website, you would actually be redirected to that sp the specific brand that only existed for that uh, state and, uh, and so on. So you yeah, had this really complex um, 
complex set of redirects. And um, we also wanted to ensure a couple of other things, like we wanted to ensure that uh, VIP users could have a, a, like a straight access, or really like anyone that actually wanted to just opt in onto the new site, they could follow something and opt in and stay there. So this is just a, the following slide, it just shows a little bit the, the complexity. Um, and this doesn't include everything, because I kind of ran out of space as I was, was doing diagram, but I thought I'd just illustrate this. So you have four brands, some of the brands have a mobile version, some don't, and uh, most specifically has to do with the nature of the product and regulations where in some states and certain parts of the country, mobile betting in this case wasn't allowed. And then uh, we want to, so I, I highlighted in this greenish color where the new stuff was gonna come in. So at the top, we had, uh, that was the first rollout, we wanted to roll out uh, a mobile website for 20% of the mobile users on that specific brand, and then over there we wanted to roll out a new website, but with an opt-in only, so it wasn't a forced migration. Uh, so we wanted to try out the desktop site and then try out it on another brand, and two other brands just remained the same. Now we wanted to do all of these, and the, the previous state was built on domain names. So it, it was, this was going to be a nightmare, and we knew that. And another, another big challenge that we had to face was, because it's such a sensitive piece, we wanted to ensure that we could roll out, open up to 20%, but if something went wrong, we, we wanted the ability to quickly uh, you know, bring back the users to the old site. And uh, doing that with domain names, again, is very complex, because a user already has the mobile.new, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's very hard to then opt them out. Okay. Uh, and um, so we, we decided to build a component that sits in front of the entire infrastructure and uh, it's called a traffic splitter and it's been running in production, operating for a long, long time and really what it does, uh, it uh, uses a, ru a customized rules-based engine which looks at the requests as they are flowing through the system and inspects them, applies a bunch of criteria, and then decides where to send that request to. Um, yeah, initially I, I didn't wrote the high performance, but, but then I noticed the coffee cup on the, on the GIF and I thought I'd just put the high performance there. And uh, a more sane view of these, I guess, would be, uh, would be this, where the, we have all of the users going for this. So what, what does this mean? We uh, took all of those domains and we say, well, you know what? We want all of these domains to point to the same place. They're all going to go to this, this traffic splitter and now we're going to start coding the rules in there. And as we did that, we started collapsing the number of domains so that we really only end up with uh, one domain per brand. Uh, and some of that is, again, uh, has to do with regulation because it really is required for the name of the brand to be part of the domain in that specific case. So um, this was, a, was a, quite a complex uh, rollout strategy because it was a new component that was going to take huge load in terms of, uh, of request rates and obviously needed to be very well tested and needed to ensure all of those things that I, that I said before. So going into the details of what the component does, we have uh, the concept of an upstream. And uh, an upstream you can really visualize. I, I always have this mental idea of a river that's got one main stream and then you know, you've got water coming in through the various parts. And uh, we have uh, right now, we support three types of, uh, of upstreams. One of them is just a, a, a redirect, which I, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar, but you, you can have two types, one is permanent, another one is temporary. And really, this is, you go to the splitter, the splitter will go, okay, you know, I'm looking at our request and uh, I think that uh, you need to go elsewhere, right? Then the second one is the one that's used the most and uh, it's, just, it's just our serve and really it's, just piping the request to the right place. And then we also offer a load balancer, um, but it's a really basic load balancer. Don't, like, we use it in very specific cases in production where, um, you know, maybe where, where we have two simple servers and we, you know, we don't really want to bring in an AWS load balancer or a Google Cloud load balancer. We have that capability. It, it's got what, what, what you would expect from a, from a very simple load balancer like health checks, round robin distribution strategies. but. It's, it's really just there for convenience. We don't really make use of all of that because there are bad old balancers. So that, this is one concept of the system. It's the concept of upstreams. After that, we have um, the concept of criteria. And the, the system relies on two types of criteria. And as we define a block, which, which is, well, you know, something that matches these criteria is going to go there, we can define criteria that are in and criteria that are out. And in this case, you know, 
an in criteria is anything that will allow that request to follow for that, um, for that path. An out criteria is something that uh, will, will push the user out. As an example, an opt-in, opt-out on a website is a really common thing. So and when you're opting out, you might set a cookie on your, your browser that says, well, I don't want to see this website. So whatever is the stream that shows the new website will have an out criteria saying, well, if you got this cookie, you can't get in. Then um, another important thing is that it needed to be deterministic and stateless. And this is important because of the ability to scale horizontally. So we wanted to one request would always be matched against the correct upstream. And, uh, and of course, uh, it needs to be stateless so that we can have many of these traffic splitters running. And to give you an idea, we operate about, I don't know, maybe like something like 30 instances, for example, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment where it takes you know, peaks of about 10,000 requests per second, stuff like that. So it's, yeah, 30, I think it sounds reasonable. Then we've got the types of criteria that we currently support. Although the, the system is built in a way where it's easily extendable and anyone can just build criteria uh, to do that, we found that with all of these, we could really uh, uh, do everything that we need. So the first one is, uh, is a bucket, and this is where you specify a percentage of traffic. And you can say from one to another, you can say that you want 10% of the traffic to flow through a certain upstream. Now, it's important to understand that in terms of these percentages, they not only they, um, you know, they, they work in distributing the traffic uniformly, they are also, um, uh, they ensure that if you got bucketed into a certain upstream, you're gonna stay there. And, uh, but, but it does that not by defining the upstream at the client level, but defining it at the server level, which means that we can always kick you out without having to make changes on your browser. The other one is just looking at the host header. So this is what normally where the, the website domain flows through. We can inspect user cookies. We can inspect the path of the request. The location, so if we have, you know, if we want to do location awareness, we can look at that. It uses the MaxMind GYP database. Easily pluggable both to the free version and the, the commercial version. We can also inspect the devices, so we can you know, follow, make, make all of the desktop traffic, all of the mobile traffic, all of the iPad traffic, iPhone. It, it, it can become really, really granular. And we've used it for situations where we had a new website that, we, that actually we didn't uh, made it work on IE8. So therefore, we specify rules saying, well, IE8 can't, can't see this. Um, we also have a special type of, cri of criteria called visitor, uh, and this is really, it's something that probably shouldn't have made it into the core of the system, but uh, it just has the understanding that the user has never seen the website before. Uh, it just makes it easier to do that. And of course, we then have combinators, and or, or, which means that you can really combine all of these uh, rules in, uh, in trees of uh, logical trees to, um, to, you know, to, to say something like, well, I want 50% of the users that have this specific cookie and are accessing this specific path or anyone that comes in with a privileged cookie. Something like that. So moving on, given that we, we, we finally add one component that sat in front of the entire infrastructure, it also meant that this component uh, could do other things that, uh, that are cool. Now that you're, you're looking at all the traffic, you can do one thing, and one thing that we do is circuit breaker. Uh, who's familiar with this idea of circuit breaking? Do you, okay, so if you look at like a circuit, like a light circuit, the breaker is a switch, right? That's, you know, as we switch it on and off. So what this does, it continuously monitors the performance of the various upstreams and following certain configurable thresholds or certain configurable sampling rates and sampling mechanisms, we can say, well, if a certain upstream is slowing down, let's take out the traffic there for couple of seconds and see if it recovers. If it recovers, we bring the traffic back in and we'll, the system just does that. And the purpose is really to protect the, the infrastructure. We're kind of saying, well, you know, screw the user, like we're having, we can't serve, let's just keep our services alive. And when the services come back, the users are gonna get the experience back. Uh, and this is usually a strategy that works very well because normally if these strategies aren't in place, what happens is that your service start failing, the traffic doesn't go away that means that your services don't have the opportunity to recover. So if they're badly written or, or if they're leaking threads or something like that, they, they, they're, gonna, they're gonna suffer a little bit. And uh, moving on, I've got some examples here. I don't know if you guys can see these in the back, but this is just how, um, how the rules look when you look at the configuration file. The one on the left is just the one that I'm, I'm gonna actually use in the demo here. And uh, it just looks at the, the bucket 
from uh, 0 to 100. It looks at the device, any device that's mobile, and uh, it looks to see if you've got a specific cookie that, uh, to allow you to come in. I, I think looking at that, the bucket one is actually redundant. It shouldn't be there. Um, or doesn't need to be there. And then we've got the criteria, we've got the upstream, and you'll see that here there's only an in criteria defined. So we don't have anything that rejects that. On this, this end, we have one that I actually took from, uh, from one of our production uh, systems, and uh, I've just replaced the domain names. Um, it, it is a bit more, uh, more complex because it has a group of in criteria and a group of out criteria. So in this case, if I can read this right, it's going to do an OR. So it's doing, well, if your device is mobile and you're coming in from one of these hosts, then it will allow you in, or if you're coming in through one of these hosts. And I guess the purpose of this is that this host is a CDN host. Are you familiar with CDNs? So if we've got a CDN coming into our system, we want to make sure that the CDN actually goes to where it needs to go. And uh, you know, it doesn't follow anything. So it doesn't matter if it's coming from mobile or, or from desktop. It's that CDN domain we want to send to the mobile website. Now, there's an out criteria that sits there. And we're just saying, well, because it's mobile, it's looking at that. If you're coming in with a cookie saying that you've got a desktop, get out of this, of this uh, rule. You've got all of these rules defined. The system runs for all of them. And uh, it's got two mechanisms of then selecting the appropriate one. The, the base mechanism is uh, following. It will, it, will look, it will isolate the number of rules that actually you've got matches on all of them. So you are al allowed to see. And then from those, it will select the ones with the most defined and granular criteria. An example of that is that you know, if we wanted to include, uh, um, to make two versions of this website with a slight variation, we would have uh, one criteria for without bucket, and then we would have another criteria with the bucket saying, well, for 5% of the users, make this small variation. And uh, this allows the system to be you know, very dynamic. The other selection mechanism is a priority selection, where we say, well, if you want for the rules and if you match this one, stop here. So it's, 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 very, it's, you know, it's very basic, but also it needs to be very basic, because as it's, uh, as it's performing, you know, handling so many requests per second, it needs to be super fast and needs to make these decisions on the fly. Another thing that we gain out of having this component is that we get telemetry for free. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, um, with my data, you're familiar with some of our products. Statful is one of our products. It's, a, it's an IEM telemetry system. And uh, we tend to build everything that we do. And we tend to make it send metrics to this system. Uh, so in this case, what you're looking at is um, um, just a dashboard showing for a specific traffic splitter, it's showing all of the request rates. And each of these colors, it's one of the upstream. So there's clearly one upstream there that takes the majority of the traffic. And then there's dozens of them. I'm literally, this list goes behind this image. And then this is just another view of a dashboard where we can see things like percentages of traffic being dropped. So that line over there, it's actually not a good thing because it meant that the service that's behind that had a little glitch there. And the splitter was forced to drop traffic. And um, it, this is actually the number of requests that got dropped, which doesn't necessarily match the percentage. Because if, if you have uh, a, a low rate uh, service that gets dropped 100% of the time, you, you, know, you might only see 100 or 200 requests being dropped. But if you've got another one that's actually quite, um, quite uh, high rate, you, you, all it takes is about 20% of traffic dropped to drop something like 300 requests. And um, it's very common, this pattern, for us, because this is actually doing its job very well. It, it is, well, the service isn't responding correctly. Let me block the traffic. The minute the service starts responding again, OK, off you go. You, you, can, you can operate again. And um, moving on to the next uh, step, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is not yet open source. It will be uh, soon. We, uh, we just need to make it. Uh, uh, you know, just make it open source, right? I mean, it's, it's right now, there's code comments there that we probably don't want you to see. There's, there's you know, things there that, uh, that uh, aren't appropriate, and it's not, correctly, uh, it's not correctly ready to be made open source. But there's nothing here that's particularly, in, particularly uh, proprietary to us. So we really want to share this with you guys. Um, there are alter alternatives. Of course, there are for all of these things. Uh, AJ Proxy is, uh, I would say, is, 
is an alternative. I would probably not go with that if, if I had to deal with a situation like this. It's very complex to configure and uh, you would, uh, you know, if you want to especially make decisions uh, where you're inspecting the traffic, it's not the best thing. Another one is uh, if you're familiar with Lua, you might use a combination of Nginx and Lua. And uh, again, requires coding, require, requires custom builds of NG, Nginx. And uh, actually, in this specific client, they used to have an instance of this, of Lua and Nginx, and it was really a nightmare to manage because it's much easier to just look at configuration. You've got, you have one rules file where you just go for the rules and you understand what they do. Where you have code, uh, it becomes much more complex to analyze. And I'm sure that there are others. Um, we, um, you know, we did our research back then and uh, we, we figured that it would be better to build our own. So I'm gonna show you a demo of all of these. And uh, the demo that I've got set up here on, on my laptop is, um, it's quite simple. It's got uh, a traffic splitter running locally on my machine. It's got all of these websites running locally. So we've got the red site, the green site, and the blue site. For some reason, this doesn't. This is blue. So this is the projector isn't respecting the colors correctly, I guess. But uh, each of the red site, they've got a mobile version and desktop version. Mobile version, desktop. We've got the blue one, which only is really for mobile right now. And uh, we also have a slow service. I want to show you guys how the circuit breaker um, works when it's dealing with a slow service. So, demo time, I guess. I've got my Slack here, Ping. I, I, I'm not going to dare because it's probably someone trolling me. And, uh, okay. Right, so let's have a look here. Oh, that's uh, Statful. In, well, these, these are metrics coming from one of our production services right now. So I'm going to open an incognito window. I'm going to access demo.trafficsplitter.io, which is really just pointing from, to my machine. This domain doesn't exist out there. OK, so I got the red site. Cool. Now, let's have a look at the configuration so that we can understand what's going on here. All right, so we had, sorry, OK. Are you guys able to see back there? So I got the red site. And the red site means that uh, I fell into this bucket from 0 to 50, be shown the red site. Okay? So that likely means if I continue refreshing, I'm still going to get to the red site because I'm bucketed into this website. That's fine. So let's close the window and try again. As I do that, all of the cookies are gone, right? So, okay, got the red site. I hope this works. I hope I get another website. No? Red? Let's have a look and see if we've got another window here, no? I have, ah, there you go, okay. So it's essentially selecting 50-50, and uh, as you can see, it, I haven't really left the domain, but it's, it's, uh, it's very relevant to point out that these are actually independent services that are running in the background. So uh, uh, I think I've got them all here. Where are they? I've got them there, red desktop, desk green, mobile, all of these versions. Okay. So I've shown you the, this ability to do bucketing and to, to slice the traffic. So now we can have a look and look at the mobile versions. So again, I can just click there. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with the Chrome development tools, but I've just selected that little, little device toggler there. And I'm now using these with an iPad. Uh, well, essentially, the server will see it as an iPad. So hopefully, as I refresh, OK, now I'm getting the green mobile website. So again, the splitter is there looking at the, in this case, I guess it's looking at the user agent and it's sending the traffic to the appropriate place. And I guess that if we were to, to close it up, try again. Oh. I, OK, we got the red site again. And I guess it would also allow me to serve the red mobile site as I switch into the, to a mobile user. All right, so the next thing I want to show you guys is um, the ability to have uh, the blue site, but I'm going to toggle off the I'm going to toggle off the the mobile agent um, because I want to show you that this actually will only affect the mobile version. Uh, as I said before, this blue VIP website only as the, it's only available for mobile. So if I just type slash VIP, now the splitter is, as I do that, it's going to match a redirect rule. And within that redirect rule, it's gonna say, well, you match VIP, I'm gonna redirect you to another URL, 
and uh, which is really just going to be staying on the same domain. As it does that, it will set a cookie. So the splitter also has the ability to, uh, to delete and set cookies. Um, right, OK, so I got the same website. You'll note there that the, there was a question mark welcome there. But I still got it, got the red one. And, and the reason is that I'm not using a mobile device. So if I do this on mobile, oh, there you go. I got the mobile VIP website. So it worked. Cool. Right, so next, uh, next part of the demo. And I, I think this is getting to, to the last part. So let's have a look at the slow service. Again, I'm on the same domain accessing a service. It's going to match slash service. We can have a quick look there at the, at the rules for that, slash, slash PIP there. OK, that's the circuit breaker configuration. There we go. OK, probably a bit too big. Let me collapse this a little bit. So we've got uh, whenever it matches slash VIP, do a redirect and uh, do this set this cookie VIP to on. And uh, where's the service? There you go. OK, slow service. So it's got one path match, and it matches service. And it will just send this to whatever endpoint is serving the slow service. Now, the slow service is running here. Um, it's, uh, it's, OK, it's not online. Is it service? Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, I, I got it right. So let's have a look. Why is it not not responding? I'm pretty sure I did this test just before the. Okay, where's the slow service? Should be there. Cannot get slash service. No. Okay. So ah, I know why. Because uh, I. Uh, there you go. This is very cool. Does anyone know why? All right, so this is actually, I didn't test for this scenario. I, I failed to have some configuration there. What happened was that I was on mobile, and I was a VIP user. And that rule took precedence over the rule to actually serve this service. Um, it's, I, I literally made this configuration in 10 minutes, so uh, apologies for the mistake. Uh, so this service, as you, as you can tell, as I refresh it, it's going to take five seconds to respond. And uh, really what it is, it's just a Node.js endpoint there that's yeah, just got a set time out there for 5.5 seconds. And uh, as it responds, it, uh, it returns this message saying, I'm very slow right now. But look, I'm, I'm refreshing it, and it's not really failing. And uh, you know, the, the site is working. It's very slow, but I get this. But uh, as I mentioned before, like the, the splitter will always look at the, at the request rates, and it will look at the performance of the service. So although the service is failing, because there's only one request going on on it, it doesn't really do anything, and it doesn't start dropping traffic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start pu putting some load on this service. And I'm going to put uh, just five clients uh, for a period of five minutes, just pushing traffic. I don't, are you able to, to see this in the back? OK, so this is just uh, running some tests. OK, we can, start, we can, we can see now that uh, the mean latency is five seconds, which is what we would expect. So if we try to refresh it now, OK, we immediately got, a, got an error. So uh, we just got served, uh, uh, I guess, a 503 um, saying that the service is unavailable. And if we keep refreshing, we might actually eat, uh, it might actually give us a, a good response. No, I guess but we can look at the load test and see it there. Right, so on the load test, it's not actually failing on all of the requests. It's only on 70% of the requests. So it's doing its best to continue delivering traffic, but at the same time protecting the service in the background. And uh, I guess, yeah, there you go. I, I think we just got one. That's going to work. Because our request went through and it's spinning. There you go. Okay, So it worked right now. And uh, yeah, it's going to be wobbling backwards and forwards, letting some requests uh, go in and others one, other ones uh, being blocked. So if I stop this, in a matter of seconds, I'm going to get the, the service coming back again. There you go. And um, I think this is about it that I had here for a presentation. Let me just go back. Yeah, excellent. This is it, guys. Thank you for, the, for seeing this. Do you guys have any, any questions, anything that you would like to, to see? Oh, thank you, Andre. Okay. I'm going to fix that rule, though, for the following presentations. Anyone has any, any questions or any, anything? I have a question. Sure. You mentioned using the server. Right. Can you but uh, you mentioned using a little balance. Uh, where would you put them uh, after the traffic splitter? 
Okay, what I mean there is that the traffic splitter isn't really load balancer, although it offers load balancing as one of the upstream types. Um, this, you usually put a load balancer in front of the splitter. So our usual setup is we have the traffic coming in through a load balancer in Google Cloud or in AWS. It's sent to, I don't, I don't know, like maybe 20, 50 splitters, it depends. And, uh, and then each splitter does its job to send it to, to the right place. Now, as we do that, let's say that you, you have two servers in the back. And uh, you don't want to bother putting a load balancer in front of them because maybe it's expensive and you know, those services are, maybe you just want to do that for resilience and it's actually two servers that are coded or maybe you don't have the capability to do a load balancer. Well, in those cases, you can use it. We use it in, we use it in some actually high profile places. It's just that it's not so much for its load balancing capability, it's more for its health check capability. So we've got a, a specific case where um, where we, we, need, we have a part of the infrastructure that needs to talk to uh, an external partner. And there are two servers there, which are set up there because of the, the way the networks are configured and the VPN rules and the availability zones and so on. And then we've got, our, we've got a splitter in front of those things that will just send it to one or the other, but it continuously monitoring, monitors both. And if one of them goes down, it will just take it out of service and uh, we start using the, the other one. Did I answer the question? Excellent, cool. Does anyone have any other questions? Hey, go on. Uh, okay, hi. So uh, my question would be if uh, Traffic Splitter has any kind of DDoS protection? or no, if it, okay. it doesn't. That's uh, way too, too complex to do at, at, at something like this. You okay. probably want to do that at network level. And okay. uh, that's, that's a really good example of, of where you should use a, an actual load balancer. Okay. But no, it doesn't. So we would put a load balancer before the traffic splitter to avoid. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the DOS section is not just a load balancer. You want to make sure that you've got the you know the, the hardware devices there that can look at the at the scene floods and things things that the load balancer just wouldn't be able to do. Um, yeah, but you would usually set up a fence around your infrastructure where anything going through the network goes through these monitoring devices. Um, there's actually some really interesting people doing that on Google Cloud. If, if you're interested, I can, I can point you to okay. that. <laughs> nice. Thanks. No more questions? No? Excellent. Guys, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>